place in the kingdom, sitting beside, as Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 28, with Abraham and with Jacob in the kingdom when his greater son will come. So what greater honour could there be for this quiet, unassuming man? Now we know the story of Isaac begins, obviously, long before he was born. It begins with Abraham and a promise made by God to him that he should move from his country in Haran. And when he was about 75 years old, um, those promises made to him would have seemed, well, they, we better make sure that things happen because I'm getting old. He appears at this time to have been already wealthy when he moved and with servants and stock. But 15 years go by from the initiation of God's promise to him. Abraham questions, I'm still waiting. I have no children. But he's told by God that your heir will be your own child and not from a servant. Okay. He has faith in God, so but another 11 years go by. And Abraham and Sarah can't wait any longer. They forgot for a moment, or put it in the back of their minds at least, that this was a promise of God. What do they do? They instigate a human answer, and we know Ishmael is born. So for 13 years, Ishmael is the focus of Abraham and and. and Sarah. In Genesis, tw uh, Genesis 17, he is told that though Ishmael is his son, he is not the one through whom the promises will come, though God will surely bless him. It will be a through a son born of Sarah, and he is to be named Isaac. Isaac is eventually born to unspeakable joy of Sarah, as you can imagine it would be after all those years. But right from the beginning, seeds of discontent that were sown by them 14 years, 13 or 14 years ago, when Ishmael came into the world, start to bear fruit. I think you remember the story in, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. And some of these quotes, because of what I want to try to get through his life, we might necessarily turn up them, but I'll just have to ask you to, to either turn them up yourself as I speak about it, I might refer to a verse and talk about the verse, and if you want to turn it up, feel free to do so. But there will be many parts of this story that I'm sure you'll know fairly well. Isaac is weaned. Now, in those days, it could have been three to five years old before he was weaned. And Abraham ordains a great feast, possibly calling in the surrounding chieftains to celebrate the weaning of, of his son. Now, there was no great record of a feast on the birth of Isaac, which is a little strange. But now that he's weaned, he's got through that first period of life when hopefully he will, will grow and uh, become a man um, and be independent, a feast seems proper. But the trouble that's been brewing the last three to five years now rears his ugly head. Remember the story. Sarah hears and probably sees Ishmael mocking her little boy. He, by this time, is a, is a teenager. And he's mocking him probably by words and, and by verbally may, maybe more. How could this weakling, this three to five year old, be the heir? I'm older, and it's rightfully mine anyway. And he certainly showed his character even at that young age. And we know that Sarah heard this, and so she goes to Abraham, and Ishmael and Hagar are thrust from the family. As far as she is concerned, Isaac is the heir. He is her son, the only son, and therefore... Hagar and Ishmael must go. Now we know that Abraham protested against this, but eventually 
he put them from the family. So Ishmael is removed from the family circle. He's separated from Isaac. And now he is the only son within the family. Yeah, let's get this going. Mm, not going to work. Anyway, don't worry about it. Okay, all I was going to tell you, I was going to put up there a timeline that I've, I've made up of these events. Oh, it's come now. Oh, very good. Okay. I'll leave it up there and as we go through, you'll be able to see the projected timeline that, that um, I've made up that seems to fit things uh, as far as I can tell. So, the only person in the household now where all the love of the, of the ageing parents is, is placed upon is this young man, Isaac. He grows up in a very loving family. The atmosphere would have been great. Nobody to divide the family love. It's all his. And certainly they loved him greatly. The influence of Ishmael in the family is erased. Anyway, told though he lives in the settled in the area of Beersheba, very comfortable, they were settled. Isaac the heir is, by this time in his life, taking over some of the responsibility of his ageing father's business, which was quite large. But it seems as though the, the way that Isaac dealt with these things was more hands-off than hands-on. He wasn't the kind of person, as we can see from the rest of his life, that got up and he wasn't a go-getter kind of person at all. He was born into this wealthy family and now he was running it uh, quite com comfortably. I feel about this time that he wasn't a child anymore. He was about 33 years old. He's not married, which was interesting. And still without an heir to fulfil God's promises, He's very truly the only son, and Abraham seems to have done nothing about it. And here's the part of the story that we read of, had, had read for us this night. He's awakened. Now think, think of this not from Abraham's point of view, think of this from Isaac's point of view, and this is, this is where these things are, are hope, hopefully give us a different perspective. He's fast asleep. And he's awakened early by a strangely insistent father. Come on, get up. We've got a six-day journey. We've got to go right now. And the only explanation he gets is that our God wants us to offer sacrifice at a particular place of his choosing and we have to travel right now, not tomorrow, not this afternoon, right now. The journey was approximately 45 kilometres, uh, 45 miles, Took about three days. Can we think for a moment what would have been the discussion? What might they have talked about? It could only have been surrounding the promises, seeing that um, Abraham had been asked to do what he had done to do. They could have talked about God's faithfulness, the place of the promised seed in God's plan. All of those things to bolster both of their faith. And when we look on the story and know what happened afterwards, you know, in those next few hours, that discussion beforehand would have been ultra important, though they didn't really know the full import of it then. Isaac didn't know it, but in a few hours his faith was to be tested in the extreme, as was his father's. Isaac asks Abraham, uh, well, look, you've got the knife and, the, and the, um, the fire and I'm carrying the wood. Where's the lamb for this sacrifice? As you read there tonight, he's told that God will provide. And they both, Abraham, Abraham's words are accepted by Isaac. Okay, that's, that's fine. So it says they go on together which I think is very interesting, in unison. They go with the same mindset, they're going to worship God, they're going to sacrifice a lamb, 
though there's no lamb visible at the moment. They build the altar. Isaac helps his father to lay up the wood. Still no lamb. Now we have an insight into the mind of Abraham through Hebrews. But nowhere in scripture is there an insight into the mind of Isaac. The only thing we can make an extension is if we, if we might like to liken these things to the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the only son that was sacrificed in, in a similar sort of situation. Apart from that, we have nothing written in Scripture that can tell us what was Isaac's thought at this time. If we believe, as it seems, that Isaac was 33 years old, which is, again, significant with the Lord Jesus Christ, again shows what kind of person he was when he allows himself to be bound. He was utterly and completely obedient to his father. There's no record of any vocal or physical resistance. Now, remember, his father was 133 years old at this time. Not a young man by any means. And if Isaac was 33 years old, he could have easily said, no, Dad, this is not going to happen. But he didn't. He didn't understand. It didn't make sense. But his trust in his father in telling him, I feel that it was God's command, was enough. When you think about it, there can be no other explanation that Isaac would allow his father to do this. He must have, been, must have believed that if God had commanded it, then it must be so. And it was the right thing to then obey his father's command. And of course, how perfectly this fits the sacrifice of the singular seed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Walking together with his heavenly father, laying down his life in a very real way, obedient to the point of death. The father in both cases not sparing their only son. And of course, the Lord Jesus, the true lamb of God. And of course, Jesus literally shedding his blood and being raised to life again, though in Abraham's and Isaac's case, it was all in their mind. Isaac didn't realise it then, didn't know the hows and the whys. But you, can you think, after God provided the, the ram caught in the thicket and Isaac was unbound and got off the altar what the conversation must have been coming down from the mountain he was a son Isaac that loved his father was knowledgeable of the promises that he made was very acceptive we see from here of divine things and he certainly had faith in his God. He was obedient when things didn't make sense to the human mind. He was the very opposite to Ishmael. Not obstinate, obviously a very sensitive, quiet young man, willing to obey his father even when it seemed as though there was no sense in what he was doing. It's very clear that at this age, Abraham and Sarah had imprinted in Isaac's heart a godly heart. Just as Christ had imprinted upon his heart his father's character. Four years go by, as you see from her overhead there. Sarah dies. His life's turned upside down again by his mother's death. She dies at the age of 127. And being an only child, it's very clear that the bond was very close. Made more so, I'm sure, by the supernatural birth as the son of promise that it was. 
And I think this is the fact of the push behind Abraham in sending his servant to his family back to Haran to get a wife for Isaac. Isaac, by this time, is approaching 140 in Genesis 24, and he's feeling his age. He's been blessed in everything. But for some reason, he's done nothing about furthering his posterity through Isaac. For without an heir through Isaac, the promises made by God couldn't be fulfilled. Now, I'm sure you're all aware that in those days, Isaac himself would have had no say in who his partner in life was going to be. No part in the selection of the bride. It just wasn't the way things were done. And again, he was completely acceptive of his father's right. He doesn't say to Abraham, uh, Father, um, I'd like a, my wife to be so and so and so and so. But I feel that he did involve God in his considerations about the forthcoming marriage. Now, again, I'll ask you to remember the story. This is a little bit of a speculation here, but it seems to fit. He'd been living at a place called the Well of Lehoaroi, and when the servant comes back after the, the journey to, to get his wife, Rebecca, he journeys back from the, the well, back to where Abraham was living, which was a few, few um, kilometres away, and it says that he was found um, praying. You know, when she came, I said, who's that man in the field? And it was Isaac. Now, the trip that the servant was going to take was about, I, th I hope this is right, as far as I could see from maps, was about 470 kilometres that the servant had to go back to Haran from Beersheba to find the wife for Isaac. So it was a journey there and back of about 17 days, uh, take 17 days to get there, so it was about a month or thereabouts where Isaac was kind of waiting and wondering what his new wife would be like. So there was a bit of a test of his faith that what his father had done and what, his, what God had promised would be fulfilled. We know that Rebecca was willing to leave her father's house, to travel to unfamiliar land, to a family she didn't know, to a prospective husband, she never met. Now, another bit of speculation. Eliezer, the servant, 17 days or there and batch to get back. What was their conversation, Rebecca's and Eliezer's conversation, on the way back? I'm sure she asked everything she could think of. What is my prospective husband like? <coughs> what does he do? How does he act? Trying to get familiar, she could before she met him. I'm sure she got to know him quite a bit before she even met him. Before she was in, in form, before she was formally introduced, Eliezer told Isaac all he had done in verse 66 of Genesis 24. So Isaac also got a picture of his prospective wife from Eliezer. And all that he would have talked about to her on the way it was then passed on to Isaac. There was no doubt that God had been working his plan and Isaac knew it. The import of verse 67 of Genesis 24 is beautiful. When it's, it's very quaint and, and just a few words, it says, she became his wife and he loved her. And that is certainly lovely, isn't it? Again, I think it could have been quite different from a lot of other arranged marriages. And even today, there are arranged marriages and the, per the people are put together regardless of whether there's any love involved. But in this, there appears to be, if we might use a colloquialism, love at first sight. And I think the love there was much deeper than first sight also because of what they'd found out about each other on the way. 
it seems as though this marriage changed Isaac from him being a depressed man from the, from the death of, of his mother, and this is about three years ago, to one of ease with himself and his life. Now, tra- chapter 26 is the... It's a little bit interesting here. In, these, um, in chapter 26, there's a few, few situations here that, that we have to put in, into, into place. The chapter 26 seems to cover at least 60 years of Isaac's life and has a timeline within it of incidents in chapter 25. So it's a little bit of a mixture, so we have to be very careful when we read these things. Chapter 26, um, in actual fact, happened before 25. Now, verse, in, in, in chapter um, 26, in verses 1 to 11, we uh, see there's a, there's a famine in the land. And they're told by God in, in chapter 26 to uh, leave the land of, of, uh, where they were living and go to Gerar because of this famine in the land. Don't go down to Egypt, sojourn in the land, and I'll be with you and will bless you. For you and for you and your descendants, I'll give these lands and I'll fulfil the oath that I've given to you. Now, there's four things that appear here. Isaac's prayer for Rebecca, there's the, from, first, from chapter 25 verse, there's Isaac's prayer for Rebecca, birth of children, sale of the birthright and the death of Abraham, and all these things happen in 25. Um, but what happens in 26 happened before any of that. So, so after the marriage, soon after probably, there's a famine in the land, as I just read. So they move to Gira under God's instructions, and they settle there. They've got the promise of safety. God's going to look after you. The promises will happen. There's physical blessings. He does pretty well living down there. And on top of that, in verse 4, there's a reiteration of the promise uh, that were made to Abraham, that they are a surety to you, Isaac, as well. Verses 7 to 9. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, My wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me for the sake of Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of the window and saw Isaac fondling Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is your sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought, lest I die because of her. Now, it's quite clear that there were no children there when Abimelech saw them. This is the main reason I conclude that this situation in 26 happened before uh, the children appeared in, in chapter 25. There's no, no family evident here at all. And we can deduce from the, the, the um, actions between the husband and wife there that this was, uh, that they were just husband and wife, no family. This is an interesting part of, 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 of Isaac's life. He had just received a confirmation that God guaranteed him his life. He's tested and he fails. Almost exactly the same way as his father Abraham did. And when questioned about his words and actions, he says, Oh, I thought I might lose my life. I was, I was worried. What a fall, brothers and sisters, from a high spiritual plane to a devastating low. And it needed a godless man like Abimelech to take him to task. That's something that would would have really 
impinged upon, I'm sure, upon Isaac when he sat back and thought about it. It wasn't God or some other man of God coming and telling him. It was a, a, sin, a, a godless man like the king of the Philistines that tell him you've got it wrong. And I'm sure he, he learnt from his mistake and in future work with God. So now we go back to chapter 25. In verse 21. Now I'm going to move this on. Here we have in chapter 25 <clears throat> Isaac praying for Rebecca for children. She appears to have been unable to have children, yet God had promised Isaac that he would have. I wonder how long it was after their marriage <clears throat> before, God, before he entreated God on behalf of Rebecca. Probably in those days, it might only have been a year, but maybe two at the very most. But you know, they waited 20, 20 years for God's promise to be fulfilled. All of us, every one of us can learn from that. It's not our time. It's always God's time. But Isaac, a man of faith, he deemed God was faithful and he waited. He didn't follow Abraham's, his father's, or Sarah, his mother's policy with Hagar. He prayed and he waited for God. In chapter 25, verse 21, the Lord answers his prayer and she becomes pregnant. For 20 years they become settled in this place and now two children, not one, have been born to Isaac and Rebecca with a promise attached. So they got more than they, were, uh, they asked for in the first place. One would have made them exceedingly happy and would have been fulfilled as they saw it, the promise that God made to them that an heir was with them, but now they had two. Another 15 years go by. Abraham dies. And this, this again shows the family situation. While Abraham was alive, the people around them in Gerar and the Philistines acknowledged that Abraham was a strong, forceful man and while he was alive, everything was quiet. They all lived comfortably with one with another. He dies. The Philistines know it. They know what kind of man Isaac is. He's a quiet, self-effacing man. Right, what's going to happen now? They took advantage of it in chapter back now to chapter 26 verses 15 to 17 we have a story there of digging wells which he had quite a right to do and then them come forcibly and saying no 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 these are not your wells they're ours and they fill them in now back in those days if you filled in somebody's well that they had dug and it was their well and you filled it in that was war what does Isaac do? Doesn't contend with them. He said, okay. He turns the other cheek. He moves on. Now he could have laid claim and had the perfect right from a human point of view to claim those wells as his. But he as Abraham was a stranger in the land that was promised to them, but a stranger in the land. So he accepts it and he moves on. And this happened a couple of times until he moved on that far away from the Philistines to a place where they eventually settled. Confrontation was not a part of Isaac. He turned away. And in effect, he showed love towards his enemy as Christ exhorts us to do. But these moves were by God. They move 
to a place near Beersheba, and that's where God wanted him to settle, and so they do. So there's no more confrontation. They settle now, again. But now there's an encounter, encounter with God in chapter 26, verses 24-25. Assurances that covenant that I, with Abraham would go through him. Don't fear the Philistines. Don't fear a famine. Don't, you'll never lack for descendants. The family will be huge. All for personal blessings because God was with him. Boy, just been told that by God. And what happens next? Abimelech turns up with his general and his retinue. And he's just been told by God that everything is well. God is with me, isn't he? Show no fear, for they can't contend with God. And so this meeting seems to be a little bit of a change in, in the demeanour of Isaac. He stands up for himself because now he he's, seems to have um, taken it to heart that God is really with him. Because Abimelech even says, oh, we've seen the Lord is with you. And it seems to have strengthened him. And I think it's a high point in the life of Isaac. So for the next 50 years, we hear nothing of Isaac's life. The enterprise he inherited from Abraham goes on well and flourishes. He's got two sons that grow and mature, very diverse characters. And we see from there that when um, Isaac is 100, Esau marries. But he doesn't marry within the family. He marries two Hittite women, and we're told that that grieved uh, his parents very much. Because the Hittites were one of the worst that surrounded them. They were one of the worst that were so adverse to any, anything that was godly. And so that caused much grief to Isaac and Rebekah. And this, of course, has sequels. It grieved them both, but it appears to do something, um, appears also to be something Isaac in time was prepared to overlook. The heart overruling the head. Not wanting to, to uh, um, acknowledge the obvious of really what Ishmael was. And we know this had dire consequences for the family because his love for Esau, over and above that of Jacob, blinkered him and probably was the reason Rebecca seemed to have, uh, have said nothing of God's promises to the boys. And that's something we don't really know. But he either, in this next situation, where, the promise, where he wants to give the promise on to Ishmael, he either didn't know or he chose to forget. We're not told. That love of one son or the other became a wedge in the relationship between Rebecca and Isaac. Their family was dysfunctional. It was not a happy family. We see there that, that uh, Ishmael dies at 137. So even though they had much to do with each other, that, that's, um, that's acknowledged in scripture. And that would have, Isaac would have been very well, well aware of that. So when we get to the next phase of his life, Isaac is now about the, the same age. If I can make this. Oh. Oh, don't worry, come on, go. Um, when he's about 137 years old, about the same age as, as when uh, his brother died, he says he's feeling his age, his eyes are dimmed, and uh, he thinks, well, I better um, pass on the promises to the family. His love for Esau, as we know, you know the next, this next part of the story, These, this is the second big thing we know of from Scripture in, in Isaac's life, where the whole story seems to really focus upon Jacob and all he does, and, and, he, and, and Isaac is just a bit player. Anyway, since 77 years of, 
uh, maybe have dimmed the, the import of the, 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 uh, what God had said to Rebecca if he did know it. So he's either ignorant or he choose to ignore the implications of the actions that he went now to do. We know, all of us know the story very well that unfolds in chapter 27. When he says to Ishmael, go out and get me some, some um, food from the bush that I love so much and cook it and bring back and I'll, I'll, I'll give, you, give you all the promises. Wouldn't you think that when Rebecca heard that, that she would rush into Isaac and say, oh, Isaac, you can't do that. For God has said, he's not going to give it through Esau, he's going to give it through Jacob. She doesn't. We don't know, really know why. Again, whether they were really on good terms at that point in time, we don't know. But she then, as we know the story, she sets in motion a deception that has dire consequences for Isaac's family for the rest of his days. So Isaac sends Esau out. He lays back on the couch, as you can imagine, and he's feeling his age, and he's, oh, I've done what I need to do. It might be a whole day before he comes back, even though he's a good hunter. It might be quite a while before he comes back. He might have to wait most of the day. But in verse 20, Oh, somebody comes in, the mule's been caught, it's been dressed, it's been cooked in a matter of hours. Almost too good to believe. There is suspicion there from the start. Who are you? Oh, I'm Esau. Oh, it's Jacob's voice. So then he feels him, as we are told, because Esau apparently had hairy arms and hands. Um... You know they put goat skins on, the, on didn't they, on, his, on the arms and that's hoped so he would feel because he couldn't see. I read about this because I, I, I know what, and you probably do know what goat skins are usually like. They're usually quite long hair and a, a person having that long hair on their arms would be, just wouldn't be so. But apparently there are goats over in that part of the, part of the world where the hair is very short. So that's the only way we can see that works. Isaac really wanted to bless Esau in preference to Jacob. There is no other way that we can look at this, this deception in any other way. Isaac was going to do what he wanted to do. But he suspected fraud. But the smell, the touch, were of his Esau. Are you Esau? Yeah, yes, I'm Esau, says Jacob. So he gives the blessing, as we know, to Jacob, him thinking it's to Esau. Now that was directly cutting across, wasn't it? God's state of position regarding the, the two of them. Of the apparent and very obvious godless life of Esau. Married those two women of the Hittites that were hateful to God. But he seems to overlook this, prepared to overlook it because he loved Esau and loved what he could give him. I think also he loved him because the, the total difference between what he was and what Esau was. Esau was a man that went out there with, with his bow and arrow or whatever else and caught wild game. Esau, uh, Esau, uh, Isaac would have never done that. I don't think Isaac ever went out of the family paddock. When he finds out, when Esau comes back and he realises what's done, his consternation turns to panic in verses 32 to 33. That literally, physically grips his body and he shakes. And he realises that it was Jacob and everything that he had attempted to do had been circumvented. Maybe then it brings back into his mind the suppressed memory of the promises that Rebecca had told him about those many years ago. No wonder he then shook. 
But the thing that comes out of this, brothers and sisters, is this. He says to Esau when Esau complains, he says, I have blessed him and he will be blessed. In other words, it will stand because it was God's will. Not the deceit that brought it about, but the outcome of Jacob receiving the blessings was God's will. And that comment we have of Isaac in Hebrews 11.20 is interesting. It wasn't the fact of blessing Jacob and Esau or the difference between the blessings they gave them which showed faith. Because one was temporal and one was, was uh, going on forever. It was once it was given, believing that it would be so because God had said it would be so. It was acknowledged God's sovereignty in it all, even though he had attempted in the first place to circumvent the situation. God's will was accomplished, regardless of the will of Isaac. And he in faith said, as, as I have blessed him, it will be done. This episode, brothers and sisters, was a final straw. It tore apart his family. His preference for one son over the other had borne fruit of evil, which he and Rebecca never saw healed. They both lost sons. Nothing else now held Esau to Isaac. He only wished for his father's death because he just waited for you die, Dad, and I'll murder that son. It'll all be mine anyway. There's no love there anymore if there was before. As for Jacob, he gets sent off to his father-in-law's place, supposedly get a wife. We know that Rebecca never saw him again. He was reunited with Jacob. Uh, he saw uh, Isaac was reunited with Jacob when he was about 170 years old, about 10 years before his death. And that's told us in Genesis 35, 27. So the dysfunctional family is now virtually non-existent. You can only imagine the, the angst that was between husband and wife in this situation. Not very good. Jacob gets sent away from the family. Isaac and Rebecca are left with no sons in the household. A divided household, both grieving in different ways for Esau, for Jacob. The interesting part, it is, part about this is that Isaac is quite willing to send Jacob away to get a wife. But again, he needs to be prompted by Rebecca to do it. He's done nothing to again, like his father, to, to, to um, uh, have the marriage so there can be an heir. He just sits back and life rolls on. Again, showing a bit of the character uh, of Isaac. Isaac and Rebecca had waited for 20 years for a son and now they've lost two. We're told that Esau went to live in the area of Seir, in the area which became known as Edom. Again, looking at a map, it appears to be about 100 kilometres from Hebron where Isaac dwelt. So he went right away. Interaction zero. Jacob, he was hundreds of kilometres away. And as I said, Jacob has lost to him for 33 years. The hope of Rebecca to see Jacob again, she thought it was only a short time till Esau's um, hatred goes. She never saw him again. How this affected their relationship, Isaac and Rebecca's, can only be imagined. The family is now permanently split. Again, we have a long period of time, we hear nothing of Isaac. The ageing life of Isaac. Until his death at 180 years old, an interesting where we're told that his two sons came together to bury him in Genesis 35, 28. That's a, a quick 
go through of Isaac's life. Some of that, some of that I'm sure you know very well. A few things I hope have made live a little bit more and put maybe in perspective that maybe you hadn't considered. So what do we learn from the life of Isaac? He wasn't a strong, forceful character, as were both Abraham and Jacob. But he is shown to be submissive to his, his fathers and God's will. In accepting God's will, it also needed the acceptance of God's sovereignty in his life. Another big thing that he had to come to realise. It's interesting when you see these things, how sometimes how long it took in their lives to come to this point. Maybe that's something for us to remember. He turned the other cheek at several occasions when he was denied what we call human rights today. He learned by experience in very real ways to trust his God. And the interactions in his life showed this. He communicated with his God when things didn't seem to be going to, to plan as God had promised. But he left it in God's hands. He learned that God is in control. And God will bring about his will at the right time as God sees it. For in all things, brothers and sisters, if nothing else, we learn from this, that God is faithful to all that he has promised. And any promise that he make, made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or to us, he will fulfil. Thank you, Brother John, for that review of the life of Isaac. Um, I think we've seen from there that uh, although there's not as much written of Isaac as there is of Abraham or Jacob, nevertheless, he too showed great faith under challenging circumstances, and we can take a lot of comfort and encouragement from that. Now, by way of announcements, Bible class next week will be exploring the Emmanuel prophecy under the title, His Name Shall Be Called. And uh, general write-up, we examined Isaiah 9, 6-7 last year, which presents the concept of the child born and the son given. So in our class next week, we need to look carefully at the expression, His Name Shall Be Called. What do all these names, or would we say titles, mean? What do they tell us about this Emmanuel, our Lord Jesus Christ? And importantly, what are the exhortations we ought to draw from them? So that's next Sunday, God willing. Friday the 13th at 7.30pm at uh, Rachel and Jordan Morrison's home, the Ask class for our youth group. And they're asked, please, to bring a plate of supper to share. There's no Sunday school next week due to school holidays. So we're now going to bring our Bible class to a close by singing together hymn 156, after which, please remain standing, Brother Lloyd Turner will give our closing prayer. Hymn 156. <laughs>
most gracious and all-wise God, our Father, who searches our minds and knows our inmost thoughts, we know that we are blessed beyond our measure, Heavenly Father, and that you have remembered how we are made, that we are but dust. We offer our thanks to you for your steadfast love, as different in its greatness from anything else that we have experienced. May your guiding hand be upon us to keep us steadfast in your service. May this our prayer be an active expression of our belief in your divine sovereignty, trusting always that you will bear us up from moment to moment each day until our Lord shall come. For this we ask and our praise we present this night in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.